I'm Dr. Steve Finger, and I'd like to welcome you to another exciting episode of Brooklyn's libertarian TV show, Hard Fire. Tonight's episode is going to be very unique in that it's one of, we're going to be dealing with one of the most important subjects that anybody ever does deal with, and that's education. As we know, children that get a decent education have a great start in life and have a more successful life. Children that do not get a good education, of course, are, are, do not have a satisfactory life and have an excellent chance of being in poverty for the remainder of their life. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be school choice. And we're privileged to have with us tonight two experts in that field. Uh, Susan Cleary, who is a grassroots advocate for school choice, a district leader in the 44th Assembly District of the Republican Party. She's a mother of three and works in private industry. And Timothy, uh, Timothy Mulhern, is the president of United New Yorkers for Choice in Education. Uh, Mr. Mulhern is a former teacher or graduate of Columbia College Teachers College, Columbia University Teachers College. Uh, welcome, Susan, and welcome, Tim. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, I think bef to start the uh, the program, we should tell our viewers what exactly we mean by school choice. When we talk about school choice, does one of you like to tell us what we mean by school choice exactly? Well, the way I describe it is just by just leveling the playing field, making educational a variety of educational opportunities available, whether they're public school, charter school, which are a, that's a form of public education, non-public schools, or homeschooling. But the fact is that it should be left up to the parents to choose rather than to the government just to say that because you live in a certain place, you have to send your child to a particular school. Right. In other words, it should be different from the situation that we have now where children are assigned to a school by the government. They stay in that school, and that's the school they're going to be in. School choice means that the parents will have a choice as to the type and the school that the children right. go to. Okay. And if, and an important distinction to be made, an affordable choice. An affordable choice. Because right now, as you know, if you have the money, you can afford a lot of things that people who don't have the money just can't afford, and so they have to go to the, whatever school the government says. In other words, we already have school choice, but it's mainly for the rich, and you'd like to extrapolate that and have school choice for everybody. Right. Okay. Um, well, what, what, why exactly do we need school choice? What's wrong with the system that we have now? Is this public school system not satisfactory? or children not graduating and going on to college and having decent lives? Why, why do we need to change the system that we have now? Well, I'd first like to just back up and say um, what I believe school choice means because I experienced it with my own child. Uh, my oldest son was not able to read at grade level even though he was in an exclusive private school. So. As a mother, I found this extremely distressing, and I could see how upsetting it was to my child and how it was affecting his self-confidence and ability to learn. So I was very fortunate that I did have choices, uh, and I went out and I found what was right, what my child needed. And I think that that's what parents need to have the ability to uh, find the type of education that suits their children's needs. And when I just started to realize how many parents couldn't do that, I just thought it's really a travesty in a country like this that every child and every parent isn't able to get the best education for their child. And because of um, kind of a corrupt uh, public school uh, education environment where the education is not geared for the sake of the children, it's really right now run more um, as a monopoly, <laughs> that there is a great need for reform. And so school choice is really a mechanism to reform the corrupt and failing uh, public school education that you know, is, is really what we have. In other words, children are not getting the kind of education they need so they can be successful participants in the workforce. So the schools are really becoming more of a jobs program for teachers when they should be a jobs program for the children. Well, not many of them will be getting jobs when you have um, only a 38% a graduation rate from public school uh, uh, students here in New York City, which is means that with 1.1 million children in school, that you're going to have you know six or seven hundred thousand of them will not be graduating. That's that's a pretty horrific statistic. 
that <coughs> sort of they're not going to be able to, they're not going to get a diploma, they're not going to get at least a minimum education at a time when a college diploma is, is considered to be a necessity for almost any entry level job. And most people need to get graduate degrees. Now you're saying that two thirds of the students in, in New York don't even get a high school diploma. So and we're spending $15 billion a year on these 1.1 million children. Right. And, it, and the outcome is, is horrendous. Mm. And um, I just think it cannot be acceptable. And every option needs to be on the table when it comes to this important criteria for success. And it's not just success. It's, it means that the children who do not get a high school diploma are much more likely they're at, at risk for almost every tragic outcome in life, uh, mm. being imprisonment, being uh, addicted to <coughs> drugs, everything that we never want to see when we see that newborn infant. That's, these are the worst possible things that we can imagine for their, for their you know, future. So if children can't read, and they, they, then they lose faith in themselves. They get bored, they drop out of school. And this is just something that every option needs to be examined. And unfortunately, um, it has become a political football, and the children are the ones that are suffering. And um, I think Tim can talk more about some of the legislation and mm -hmm. that, we, that we need and that we would really love to see parents and so it's not, so it, not, it really isn't a shortage of money. You're saying $15 billion is being spent. That's the last I heard, it's over $12,000 per year for each child in the public schools. So it's not that the schools are being deprived of money, it's just they're not being spent, it's not being spent appropriately. It, it's being wasted on bureaucracy. Very little of it really gets to the classroom and to the children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, Tim, you're, you're the head of an organization which which advocates for school choice, and I know you have several methods in which you'd like to improve the public school system. What, uh, what would you like to do to make the school system better? What I'd like to see is, as I said, you know, obviously parents have the opportunity to choose where their children will go to school. If, if a parent w thinks that the child would get a better education in a non-public school, then that should be an affordable option just like homeschooling or charter schools or the traditional public schools. Some of the public schools are good. I come from a family where we've had public school teachers. I had an aunt who taught in Brooklyn for 47 years, and I'm sure she was an outstanding teacher, as were her colleagues, but that was many years ago. I, since I live in the suburbs, I'm not sure of all the um, failings and problems within the city schools now, but I know that um, statewide that, that some of the problems that we see here in the city are also um, seen in in the suburbs and in the upstate sure. school districts. Well, well how would you how would you like to, to empower parents to to make this to make these choices most parents well, can't pay for a public pay taxes for the public school system and pay for a private school I think in an ideal world in a perfect <clears throat> world the the, there would be a system of vouchers mm -hmm. where a, a parent would get a piece of paper and be able to take that to whatever school he or she wanted for his or her child and the school would redeem that with the, with the government for the cost of the education. There would be something like what we do with food stamps exactly. or Section 8 rent exactly. housing. The same. You're advocating something similar to that. Right. We'd like to see something similar to that. Well, what I'm saying is mm -hmm. in, a, in a perfect world, Okay. That's how it would be. Okay. A perfect world is one untainted by politics. Mm -hmm. The politics enter in, and because there are um, some negatives in a lot of people's minds associated with vouchers, whether they're legitimate or not is another story. But in Albany, for example, there are some elected officials' offices in which the V word is one of the most vile words. Why, why is that? Why is there so much opposition uh, to vouchers? Because of the um, people who, are who, are, who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Who are? <laughs> you don't have to name names. We'll settle for categories of people. Um, <laughs> So you're saying that people are I don't actually want working to, in the system of the I know a, I, to the vouchers? I know a lot of public school teachers who use the non-public schools for their own children. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say all public school teachers are the problem. They're not. Mm -hmm. But 
it's this, there's a system that's in place in New York State that has to be changed. As Susan was saying, it needs reform. Mm -hmm. There are many problems with the system. And um, I find <laughs> that our opponents, or the opponents of a school choice, are more intent, they talk about the system. We have to preserve the system. You're going to destroy the system. Rather than focusing on the children and say, well, what's best for these kids? Where are these kids going to get the, the best education so that they can become productive members of society when they graduate from high school? So that they can go on to, to um, not only to college, but to uh, prof uh, a profession where, uh, like yourself, go into the medical field or um, any other pro profession of their choice. Um, but well, what is the op what is the the objection to vouchers? It seems perfectly reasonable. Advocates of vouchers say, "Look, we're spending twelve thousand dollars for each child in the school. Let's take six of those twelve thousand dollars, give it to the child in the form of a voucher. The remaining six thousand dollars will stay with the school. So the children that choose vouchers will go into a better school." and they'll have a better education. The ones that stay will have more money because half of that money will stay in the school for, for less students. What, what is the objection? What do you think is the objection to these vouchers? And where does it come well, from? Certainly, I have no objection to that. <laughs> um, I mean, some people, people see a diminution of the, the power structure mm -hmm. within the public education system. If you, ta if you start taking children out and putting them in schools outside of that system, that somehow the whole system will be weakened. Uh, whether or not they're actually talking about their own power being weakened, that's uh, certainly something that a lot of people would, uh, would suggest is behind it. Do, do you think it would be damaging to the public school system to have a voucher not system? Not at all. Um, I, I always use the example of the automotive industry. You know, back uh, a few decades ago, well, back when I was growing up, certainly, the American automotive industry was the uh, top in the world. And then um, along the way, they got a little lazy. They got, perhaps got a little slipshod. And um, the Japanese and the Europeans started taking some of that market share. Mm -hmm. And... Um, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler all said, you know, if we're going to regain our market share, then we have to make sure that, the, that we do the best job we can. That was because of the competition that was coming from the Germans and the Japanese. And it was only because of that competition that the, and the monopoly was broken up, that the American automobile manufacturers had, had that that's what uh, caused the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the car manufacturers in this country to produce a better product. And so who was the, the principal beneficiary? The consumer. And um, they had a choice between the different kinds of cars, and they could choose what they thought was the best. And the same thing in the education world. If you provide competition with the public system rather than having a monopoly, mm -hmm. then you're going to and give the, uh, the consumers, the parents, the opportunity to choose from among a variety of options, uh, then every, every educational option will try to get, um, try to be their best so that, they <coughs> so that they can attract the most number of students. And that's we see a perfect example of that in Albany. There was a woman from here in the city a few years ago, a woman named Virginia Gilder. I don't know if you remember the story there, but she chose uh, the, worst, the, the worst public school in Albany mm -hmm. and said, any parent of a child in this school, I will pay your tuition to go to a non-public school, or an alternative to this school. And um, about a third of the, the students left. It took Mrs. Gilder up on that choice, and that. Um, How did that affect the public schools? When the kid, the two thirds who came back the following September, they found that some of the teachers who hadn't been in quite up to snuff anymore, maybe they were a little past their prime. They had been replaced. Some of the textbooks had been modernized, updated. The building had been gotten, had been repainted. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, the physical plant was in better condition. So you're saying so contrary. because of the competition mm -hmm. that the other schools offered, um, the kids who stayed in the public school wound up getting a better education where they in that school as well. So it benefited the kids in the public school, it benefited the kids in the non-public schools. The parents in both groups were happy now because of the competition. And on a larger scale, the same thing happened in Milwaukee, <laughs> which is a fairly large uh, city that was on the forefront of vouchers and they uh, really found across the board that education improved and that a lot of people who fought the voucher system even had to admit after they saw that the public schools responded. Um, as we know, monopolies produce a bad product at a high price. And make no mistake, <laughs> our public school education today is a monopoly. And, and the only way to really have accountability where the schools will uh, have the, the absolute determination and need to change, and it's, it's a difficult job. So if they have no incentive <laughs> to change, if they keep getting more money even though the students are doing poorly, <laughs> They have no incentive. Now, they, they will um, definitely find that uh, the competition has uh, spurred them on to, to make the changes necessary. And that's really the bottom line to school choice. Yes, it's, it's, it's removing children from environments where they aren't learning, but at the same token, it's the only real possibility to have widespread uh, reform. Contrary to popular belief, uh, it's, it's not that school choice is going to destroy the public schools, but it's actually going to make them stronger by competition. And competition is actually going to make them make the public schools better than what they would be ordinarily. Is that what you're saying? Yes, but if I could just add one thing to what Susan had said. You talked about Milwaukee, where the, uh, some of the strongest opponents had to concede the uh, value of the uh, voucher program. They've actually become strong advocates of it and of the expansion mm -hmm. of the program. They've gone to the Wisconsin legislature and said this thing is working in Milwaukee and we think it should be expanded. Well, especially you have some cities really like Washington, D.C. Where the, excuse me, where yes. the mayor yes. of Washington has come out in support of the D.C. voucher program. Mm -hmm. And that, that was one of the things that uh, right. helped Congress pass the D.C. voucher part of the um, D.C. B appropriations bill in 2000. And because the mayor was in favor of it. Well, he convinced some, <coughs> of the, some of the members who might have otherwise been a little reluctant to vote for this, mm -hmm. that it was a good thing and that it, <coughs> and that it would help the kids in his city. Mm -hmm. and it, well, unfortunately, it had been vetoed um, by Bill Clinton uh, the first time that it was presented by uh, Congress. And, of course, uh, Bill and Hillary had the luxury of sending their daughter to exclusive private school, yet uh, when it came time to poor minorities who were stuck in not only schools that weren't teaching them, but quite dangerous schools, they uh, vetoed it. So we do have a lot of politicians, I think, that need to allow the same kind of choices for their constituents. Unknown. Un unnamed hypocritical <laughs> politicians. We will not name because we want to keep, right. our, oh. keep right. our program on the air. Okay. Okay. Another obstacle that's that people have mentioned. Some people say that if we take all these kids out of the public school, there won't be private schools for them. They'll be they'll be leading in one big group, and there just won't be a place to put them. What do you what do you say to that? Well, certainly right now, as things stand, there probably aren't enough seats in the non-public schools, mm -hmm. but we would see new schools open right. or schools that might be 50 percent filled now or on the verge of closing they would see a renaissance and I think that not only would that be good for education but you might see people who um, are involved in the construction trades get new jobs because they're building schools um, it'd have a rippling effect in the economy if they were going to build new schools in other words, to if the children, these if, kids. It, if there were children and they had the money that the schools would, would come into being. Something I like, think so. Something like sure. the automobile industry. Sure. When the first cars were made, there were no gas stations, there were no roads. People would take tanks of gas with them and, and tools. And then as people bought cars, gas stations came into being. People learned mechanics. And then they built highways. And it would be the same thing with the public schools, with, with private schools. If the children would, were, were uh, amenable to that and there was money for it, eventually these schools would come into being. Right. Okay. 
Um, I know that you've been very active, Tim, in, uh, in trying to get some legislation passed on a federal level. Uh, do you want to tell our audience something about that? Sure. Well, we had been focusing our efforts at United New Yorkers for Choice in Education on Albany because we're a statewide group. We felt that that there should be a, a very limited role for the federal government in education, if any role at all. Uh, we're not advocates of of big federal programs for education. But we found that because Albany is such a difficult environment to get substantial reform accomplished, that we would do better if, <coughs> excuse me, if we turned our attention to Washington. Uh, right now, we have a Congress that's more amenable to school choice. We have a president who's a strong advocate of school choice. And we think that um, that the time is ripe for this kind of legislation. Now, at, towards the end of the uh, 109th Congress, which just ended, there were two bills that were introduced, one by Congressman Vito Fisella from here in New York, which would have allowed a, a tax credit for parents who um, send their children to public or to uh, private or religiously affiliated schools. This would be a federal tax credit. Yes, on, the, on your federal income tax return. Mm -hmm. And uh, Congressman Fisella was able to get 40, uh, 39 of his colleagues to sign on to the bill. It was also introduced in the Senate, this, an identical bill introduced by Senator Martinez from Florida. And um, that, because the Congress then came to a close, that bill... They're still languishing. Well, we don't know whether it's going to be reintroduced Was your organization or advocating for a specific bill, or are you just supporting these bills that you're describing now? Well, what I did was to sit down with Congressman Fisella <clears throat> and describe a, what we had done in Albany, the, ta the Education Tax Credit and Education Incentives Act that we had introduced in Albany, Senator... Um, Maltese of Queens and Assemblyman Hikand from Brooklyn had introduced a bill in Albany. And so... <clears throat> this was the tax credit bill. A, it's a tax credit bill. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I adapted it from the New York State tax law to the Internal Revenue Code so that it could be introduced in Washington as a federal tax credit. And what this bill would do would allow taxpayers to contribute to a public... A public school, a public education entity, whether a, a traditional public school, a public school district, a charter school, and because there are a lot of schools in the state that a lot of parents are, are happy with, and, um, or if a, if a um, so your bill, will, your, your your bill would allow taxpayers to make actual contributions to the public school. Right. How would it help school choice? How would it help okay, the private because schools? Because if they don't want to contribute to a, scholar, uh, to a public education entity, the alternative under our bill is that they can get a tax credit for a contribution to a private scholarship fund. In uh, New York City, you have the Inner City Scholarship Fund, you have the uh, Student Sponsor Partners. There are a variety of these uh, foundations which provide scholarships around the state. Mm -hmm. and. Um, by giving a tax credit to the donors to these funds, uh, th uh, these organizations would be able to lay, raise a lot more money, so there'd be more money available well, about, for the scholarships. What about tax credits for parents who send their own children to private schools? Was that going to be included in your bill? No, because uh, what we're trying to do, as I mentioned before, uh, vouchers, while we, while we think the vouchers are great, uh, there are too many political problems with vouchers, mm. and that would be portrayed as a voucher in disguise. And so what we've done is to put language in the, b in the bill that would be a couple of steps back from that, mm -hmm. so that this can't be attacked as a, as a voucher in disguise. Right, right. And there are other proposals on a federal level, as you probably know, would be to use the money that's being allocated for Title I. Mm -hmm. And instead of sending it directly to the school, it would be sent as a, as a scholarship with the child, and the child could take it to the school of, its, of his choice, his or her choice. And they're talking about uh, amounts 
$1,500 or $2,000 that could be given to each child, and there would be no problems with, with local, uh, local objections because it would be on a federal level. Let me ask you, on a local level, on a local level, um, we've heard that part of the obstacle, part of the problem is what it's called Blaine Amendments, which would yeah. prohibit the federal government, the state government, from contributing to private schools. Do you, do you have any plans? Do you uh, it's not so much they would pro be prohibited from contributing to private schools. What, a little, just a couple of seconds worth of history on this. There was a congressman from Maine, James Blaine, back in the late 1800s, mm -hmm. who was a rabid anti-Catholic. Right. And he had introduced this legislation in Washington and uh, to prohibit any money going to, ca to religious schools, because in those days, most of the religious schools were Catholic schools. And um, his amendment to the U.S. Constitution failed by only a few votes. But what a number of the states did was they incorporated it into their state constitution. Right. So, for example, New York State has a Blaine Amendment. So on a local level, in other words, it would be very difficult for the local governments to make any contributions to vouchers if they were going to be used on a religious on a religious level, we have to get that rid of the blame. That's and the that's the objection. Right. But there could right. be more secular <laughs> private schools. Right. Right. So okay. It, well, look, it looks like we're in the middle of we're in the middle of what is a very exciting program, and I know we could go on much longer. And we'd like to thank both of our guests, Susan Cleary, and uh, Tim Mulhern, for coming here and talking to us about uh, school choice. Uh, maybe we'll have another program sometime. And to our viewers, thank you very much for turning into a, tuning into another episode of Hot Fire, the Libertarian TV program. Thank you and good night.